My heroes are no more neurotic than the audience. Uh, unless you can feel that a hero is just as fucked up as you are and that you would make the same mistakes that he would make, you can have no satisfaction when he does commit a heroic act. Because then you can say, hell, I could have done that too. And that's the obligation of the filmmaker, of the theater worker, to give a heightened sense of experience to the people who pay to come to see his work. I personally got to meet and know Nick Ray because uh, I was attending graduate film school at NYU in the late 70s. The director of the school was Laszlo Benedek. He said, this year we're going to have a visiting professor, the director that I know you love, Nicholas Ray. Ladies and gentlemen, film is a way of life. I can't teach you how to make film, but it has to be experienced. So I, I walk in the room, Nick Ray's there. I still remember he had really wild hair. He had his eye patch on. And he said, sit down, what's your name? I told him my name. He said, uh, can you define the word dialectic for me? And I started sort of rambling. Yes, uh, well, there's the Hegelian master-slave dialectic. I know thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Uh, Marx, Engels, what, he said, fine, that's enough, that's good. All right, and uh, you, you really, uh, you love films? And I said, I love films, I love writing, I love photography, I love everything that goes into filmmaking. And he said, great, okay, Jim, uh, you're my assistant for this year. <laughs> so I became his assistant. The camera is an instrument. It has magical qualities to it. You can photograph thought. They cooked their own sweet time sent in for me. Who are you? They Live by Night is one of my favorite films made by anyone and maybe the greatest first film of any director. For me, it's the, it's the style of the film, the, the beauty of how it's made, but it's the, the theme of the film is his complete compassion for these characters that are truly innocents. I don't guess I know much about talking to women. Uh, how to talk, I... How long were you in that prison? Seven years. It's a crime film, essentially, but it's really a classical f romantic film, a tragedy. So he used these forms, these genres, but he would mix them. He would not use them in the predicted way. And, and this is extremely beautiful to me. The very opening of the film is something very tender, is two lovers. The two main characters, Bowie and Kichi, together sort of caressing each other in a tight shot. And then we are, uh, we have this famous helicopter shot following a car. Now this is probably, as far as I know, the first time a helicopter shot was ever used as part of the the dramatic element of the story rather than a kind of opening, establishing uh, visual effect. He said that he wanted this helicopter shot to be like the long arm of fate. I've been in a little trouble. You look it. What happened to you? They are innocent in the world. They don't understand the world. There's a very, very moving sequence toward the end of the film where they walk through a park together and they're contemplating what it might be like if they can live a so-called normal life. And they see people, I remember, playing golf or something, and they, they go to a nightclub. But they're just, for a moment, they're doing things normal people do. But this long arm of fate that has been planted in us very early in the film is not going to allow that to happen. I don't like you and I don't like her and I don't like the both of you together. You listen to me. You're a thief, just like me. And you ain't gonna go yell on us. Keechi's gonna stay here. And if you or anybody else don't like it, it's just too bad. 
also the idea of darkness and light in that film particularly. It happens a lot in Nick Ray's films. The darkness is very protective. They Live by Night is not a kind of crime film with uh, urban gangsters with pinstripe suits, etc. These are hillbilly criminals, you know. They're, it's a kind of brutal, unrefined world that we enter. I don't need you. I can crack any bank in this country alone. The music in They Live by Night is very important. There are quite a number of songs in the film. There's a, a wonderful use of a Woody Guthrie song. He loved Woody Guthrie. When Nick lived in Virginia, he used to sleep on his lawn sometimes, you know? We'd wake up, oh, Woody's out there. <laughs> Going down the road feeling bad when the escaped convicts are burning the car they escaped from. That song is playing on the radio. Nick told me that in one of his rare moments of actually seeming like a teacher, which he would probably cringe at. He said, you know, uh, I think it's very bad to talk to the actors ever together. Um, it's best to talk to actors alone because the scene is different for all of them. In my experience, the single most helpful way that you can direct an actor is by giving him a specific action. Why is he there? What is he doing? And this is something I always do. I have always talked to the actors separately. I don't want to confuse them with what's the overall meaning of this scene, because it doesn't mean the same thing to each of them. If I want to get you angry and prepared for a scene which has to do with intellectual revolutionary content about which you don't give one good goddamn in the world, I have to touch responses in you on your own level. Do you dig? Nick Ray was not above emotionally toying with the actors to get things out of them. I, I know that he would play some, he would do things that I personally would never do. He would play psychological games sometimes. Well, hell, I've only had two fights with actors in my life, really. And you use what is of their essence at the moment. Johnny Guitar is an almost a Brechtian Western, and uh, in it, Joan Crawford plays a character, Vienna, who's visually made very harsh. And he wanted, uh, in a certain scene, he wanted Joan Crawford to be very, very angry. And so he had someone take her own clothes and a lot of her wardrobe out of her trailer and throw it in this big puddle in this road that's part of the set. I think Nick personally drove over it in a car just to make her really, really upset. And I said, well, how did that work out? And he said, fantastic. Boy, was she upset. <laughs> did you see Mr. Steele last night? Yes, as I came home, I saw him going to his apartment with a girl. That girl was Mildred Atkinson. She was murdered between one and two o'clock this morning. In a Lonely Place was based on a book by Dorothy B. Hughes. It's a portrait of a very psychopathic character. Nick's transformation of this book is Still a portrait of someone verging on psychopathology. It's for me Humphrey Bogart's greatest, greatest go role. Ahead, go ahead, brother. Squeeze harder. You love her, and she's deceived you. You hate her patronizing attitude. She looks down on you. She's impressed with celebrities. She wants to get rid of you. Um, I know that Nick Ray at one point said something about Humphrey Bogart's performance, saying. You know, the guy is amazing when you don't give him any props. Don't give him a gun. Don't give him anything. Just, just strip him to his own emotional core. And uh, Humphrey Bogart is fantastic in this film. It also stars Gloria Graham, who is also, for me, an incredible gift to cinema. I love Gloria Graham. It's a good thing you like my face. I'd have been in a lot of trouble without you. I only told the police what I saw. I have no idea what you did after you closed your Venetian blinds. Oh, oh, you'd be surprised. Um, they were married uh, 
Nick Ray and Gloria Graham. At the time of their shooting in a lonely place, they had separated emotionally, but they had not told anyone this, and Nick would not let anyone know while they were shooting. You annoy me. If I do, it isn't intentional. In a Lonely Place is also a kind of uh, unusual blending of a kind of very dark crime film, but really with a, a character study, a metaphor for Hollywood also, that really the entire film, well, not so metaphorically, uh, a critique of Hollywood, certainly. I won't work on something I don't like, but are you in any position to be choosy? You haven't written a hit since before the war. You haven't had one because you've made and remade the same picture for the last 20 years. You know what you are? You're a popcorn salesman. Nick Ray never liked things all tied up in ribbons at the end, so he was always thinking about the ending. Romances don't have to end that way. Marriages don't have to end that way. They don't have to end in violence, for Christ's sake, you know. And another thing I learned from him, or I, I copied from him, is that I know that he often shot out of sequence, and I prefer to shoot out of sequence, usually because I don't want the actors too ingrained in how the story is working. Nick Ray said to me once, make every scene like it's a, a beautiful bead on a necklace, and don't think about any of the other beads. But when you have, when you've made them all beautifully and they're in the right order, you have a beautiful necklace. And so he also said, yeah, you know, uh, Sam Fuller told me this too, always shoot the ending scene last because, you know, it, you might want to change it and you might be out of money and they might not be able to bring you back and fix it. And? Bigger Than Life was inspired by an article that Nick read in The New Yorker about a school teacher who uh, was given cortisone, uh, ended up abusing cortisone and having uh, psychotic episodes as a result. I will not tolerate your attempts to undermine my program for Richard. Yes, darling. I see through you as clearly as I see through this glass picture. If you imagine I'm going to be fooled by all this sweetness and meekness, yes, darling, no, darling, you're even a bigger idiot than I took you for. Let's clear this up once and for all. I'm staying in this house solely for the boy's sake. It's uh, about conformity. It's about expectations of society. But it's really a metaphor for Really, for me, it's a, a metaphor of, of the American dream becoming a nightmare. You're not in the hospital now! And in one of the most famous lines in American cinema, uh, James Mason is about to go upstairs with a pair of scissors. He's going to kill his son. He's telling his wife in that James Mason way, you know, but God told Abraham to kill Isaac. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But Ed, you didn't read it all. God stopped Abraham. And James Mason stops and says, God was wrong. God was wrong. And it goes up the stairs. It's incredible. It's terrifying. When I turn the lights out, drink this, please. It is one of the most amazing uses of color in filmmaking, of color having emotional resonance in a way, and what colors mean in the film. There's another incredible thing in this film, which is the lighting sources get lower and lower as the film progresses. If you were to run the film in high speed, you would notice the lighting sources getting low, and it becomes nightmarish and expressionistic. Got a court in six hours. There's a scene where he's really being abusive to his son doing his math homework and his shadow on the, on the wall becomes a grotesque, monstrous thing. It it's fast. subtle unless you're aware of it. I like the promise, I like the hope. I enjoy acting, I enjoy everything in the theater. The celluloid strip is a bloodstream for me. Nick Ray was always very appreciative of collaboration with people he worked with, but most prominently the actors. I like this very much. And for him, 
The casting of his films was the thing he would fight the hardest for, I believe. For Rebel Without a Cause, he, Nick had to fight to get this little trio of amazing actors. Of course, James Dean, Natalie Wood, and Sal Mineo, who are so perfect in the film. He really appreciated actors. He obviously formed a very, very close relationship with James Dean. I think they saw parts of each other in themselves. He drove across country, I believe from New York to LA or the other way around with James Dean, the two of them, before starting to shoot uh, Rebel Without a Cause, just to know each other and understand each other. Um, he had planned to make several more films with James Dean. I really think directors who have not had the experience of acting are, are crippled to some degree. The director has to help an actor contribute. It's one of his functions. I think in all of Nick Ray's films, you will find the accumulation of detail to be very, very expressive. And for me as a filmmaker, and I never would ever compare myself in any way to Nick, but because he did guide me when I was young and, and still does, you know, I am very attentive to everything that's seen in the film, if it's an ashtray or what kind of shirt. Or, these things all add up. The film is made to catch moments. The director's function is to see that those moments occur. I think that Nick's relationship with Hollywood was very problematic, always. If you look at uh, In a Lonely Place, it's a, a meta not even a metaphor, but a kind of depiction of kind of contamination of a lot of things by Hollywood. Nick had more and more interference in films he was making. It was less pleasant. It was more of a fight. Uh, it took a toll on his health, I think, um, like it did on a lot of our great gifts, like Orson Welles or, for me, Buster Keaton, you know, some of our greatest contributors to cinema, American cinema. I think it was just a very long process of him shedding Hollywood and Hollywood certainly shedding him. They don't have the use for this kind of incredible gifted person that doesn't back down. In all of his films, there's the interior of the person, the character, and the exterior of the world, and they don't align. And the world causes pain and disillusionment and betrayal, and yet he's so sympathetic to the interior of these characters. Obviously, his films are always about, almost always about outsiders and alienated people. So he was very tuned into that. That was his, it was what he understood about life. It's what his films are about. Masterful gift to cinema, Nick Ray. You know, the working title of nearly every poem, play, short story, any screenplay, anything I've ever written has been I'm a stranger here myself. 